World War II is unparalleled in all the history of the world. It was the greatest and most costly conflict ever fought, taking the lives of more than 70 million people. It was the United States air power that altered that outcome of the war and forever changed the lives of every person alive today and will continue to do so for generations to come. I'm Barbara Novikoff, and today we are at the Palm Springs Air Museum, which houses one of the largest collections of World War II military aircraft. Join us as we journey back in time and travel through our history to touch the aircraft and the people who made that history possible. The director of the Palm Springs Air Museum and person responsible for helping to make today's production possible is Sharon McGuire. And we are also honored to have as our guide and historian, Blaine Mack, who is also a volunteer and a docent of the Palm Springs Air Museum and educational director. Sharon, could you tell us and give us a little background as to a little history to the museum? First, we'd like to welcome you, Barbara, to the Air Museum. Everyone involved is extremely proud of our museum. I think it's important to remember as you walk through that, one, we are a 501c3. Our mission here is education, not only of the young people, but of the middle generation. And also, as you look at the planes, remember that they all fly. This sets us apart from many other aviation museums in the world. And what we're most proud of are many of our volunteers are veterans that have flown these planes. So what are we going to see today at the museum? Well, first of all, we're going to start off by showing you one of the prettiest museums you've ever been in. We're very proud to show that off. Secondly, you're going to see some beautiful airplanes. They're broken up into three hangars. Our, uh, one hangar is dedicated to the Navy aircraft of World War II. The center hangar is the, dedicated to the Army aircraft of World War II. And on our newest hangar, the third one, uh, houses Miss Angela, our B-17, along with a couple other aircraft. And, and another surprise we'll let you see when you get in there. So uh, you're going, I, again, we need to remind you that all of these beautiful aircraft you're going to see do fly. And they do fly from time to time here. And we're very proud of that. Great. Well, are you ready? I'm we ready. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> we have a total of about 27 aircraft in our museum of various kinds. We have trainers, bombers, fighters, torpedo bombers, observation aircraft, just about the, the whole gamut of the World War II. We don't have everything, but we have something of every type. We're located right now in the Pacific hangar, which is where we house the Navy and the Marine aircraft of World War II. And the mural behind us right here is a perfect depiction of the Navy in action, uh, a carrier landing of the F4U Corsair, which we're gonna talk about later on. We're standing on either side of, of two of the most famous aircraft the Navy flew during World War II and we will talk about them. The one on my left over here is the F4F Wildcat, built by Grumman Aircraft, and that's the one we're gonna talk about in just a minute, because we have some nice tales to tell about that one right there. And Blaine, do these planes actually fly then? Yes, they do, uh, from time to time, and they will be flying uh, again next fall. We're we stay down for the summer and, and get them all in good shape and they'll be putting on exhibitions. I'd like to tell you about these two that we have right here. Again, I, I will refer back to the F4F Wildcat. It's um, famous because this is the frontline fighter the Navy was flying when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. As a result, all of the early Navy and Marine aces got most of their kills flying an F4F Wildcat. One of the most famous is uh, Butch O'Hare, who got caught out. He aborted his mission because a tank wouldn't feed, was heading back to his carrier, and ran into a whole fleet of Betty bombers heading for his carrier. He took them on single-handedly and shot down five before he landed, became the Navy's very first ace. O'Hare Field at uh, Chicago is named after him, and, and probably always will be because just recently they had a big election there to find out if they would, should change the name. It was absolutely overwhelming. You do not change the name of O'Hare Field. 
The other aircraft on our right here is the F-6F Hellcat, which is also built by Grumman. And this became the Navy's frontline fighter for the remainder of the war. And the, both Navy and Marine flew this, and it's a marvelous old airplane. Mm. Well, each of these planes must have their own very, very personal story, just like the O'Hare story. Oh, they do. Uh, and it's interesting because we have a, a lot of people here, our own docents, volunteers, mostly docents, who flew these in combat. And it, it's nice for them to be able to pass on some of their stories. The F-6F became legend. It was uh, famous for the Marianas turkey shoots and, and other things that, that really cleared the skies uh, in the Pacific. Because after all, the air power was what made it possible for the sea power to dominate the war in the Pacific. And uh, so therefore we have a lot of great tales to tell uh, about the airplanes and, and we can tell them all day long and, <laughs> and we usually do. We're now standing in front of the F4U Corsair, one of the finest fighters of, of World War II, mostly a marine fighter. Great airplane. And tell me, why, why were the wings shaped this way, Blaine? Well, there's a reason for it. If you look at the size of that engine up there and that huge prop that it's swinging, they have to have a way of clearing that off of the deck. So to, in order to not build huge high landing gear, they bent the wings down in what we call an inverted gull. In so doing, they made one of the most stable fighters of World War II. Beautiful aircraft. And was this plane in a movie? Yes, it was. This was uh, in the TV series, Baba Black Sheep, which was a picture of Pappy Boynton's experiences uh, in World War II. And he is probably the most famous of the Marine fighter pilots, and, and a good one he was. Well, uh, wonderful. I, I understand there's some other planes here that were actually in the Pearl Harbor movie. There were, and would you like to see those? I'd love to. Oh, yes. <laughs> this beautiful airplane you see here is a flying example of the Spitfires that were famous in Britain during World War II. These were the true heroes of the Battle of Britain. It was these aircraft that were scrambled after the German ME-109s that, uh, that were escorting the bombers that were bombing all of London. And we've all seen pictures of the, the burning of London. Just a very small handful of these pilots literally saved Britain and in essence saved us too. The airplane that's be behind us yet is the P-40 that's the made famous first of all by the Flying Tigers. This was the Army's frontline fighter at the time the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And uh, again, these have a rich history. They were phased out at the very tail end of the war. That's a B-25 that Mitchell made the first raids off of the carrier over Japan with Jimmy Doolittle at the lead. All three of these airplanes that we've looked at here were in the movie Pearl Harbor. I understand you were a World War II veteran and it was Lieutenant Colonel Blaine Mack. That's right. And you had a dream when you were 13 years old. Is this how it all began for you to be a pilot? Well, that's pretty much how it all began. When I was 13 years old, somehow several of us became just intensely interested in flying military aircraft and in particular Army fighters. And that became a dream of mine. And, and I never thought it would happen. Uh, we came from a poor family, as almost everyone did then. And the chances of getting into West Point were slim to none at all. In my senior year in high school, suddenly the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. I had just turned 17. And I said, you know, this is a horrible thing. But maybe this is that blessing in disguise that I always wanted. And about 14 months later, I was on a train to Santa Ana. By th this time, I'd passed my 18th birthday. I was on my way to Santa Ana to enter pre-flight school for Army Aviation Cadets. And I was thrilled to death. Several times along the way, I wondered if I'd make it. But I finally did. And I've graduated many, many times. But, but none of them stand out like my graduation from flying school. It's up here, and the next best one is right about here somewhere. 
Uh, I spent the, I went to night fighter school where I flew this beautiful B-25 that's behind us. It's still one of my favorite aircraft. And uh, I had some unfortunate incidents. There was a couple of them, and one of them I left all over the landscape in Southern California. Uh, but we survived, and I finally ended up going through the night fighter training and on into P-38s which was unquestionably the most delightful airplane I've ever been around. It, it flies exactly the way airplanes are supposed to fly. I went to the Aleutian Islands and flew out of there for almost a year and a half. Some of the worst, most treacherous weather anywhere in the world. We lost a lot of people and a lot of airplanes, many of them due to the bad weather and some of them due to other causes and a lot of them got shot down and this sort of thing. So while our losses weren't as high as some places, they were a lot worse than other places. But I still had a deep attachment for a P-38. I got out of the service after the war ended, went back to college and then was recalled during the Korean War. I ended up going to Korea in F-86 as I pulled tours, instructing and in jet aircraft. And I finally ended up my last 12 years, two and a half years, flying B-47s in Strategic Air Command. And the last nine and a half years, including a long combat tour over Vietnam, which was almost the last thing I did in my military career. Uh, about 10 months after I came back, I retired and uh, looked back on it. And I was really fortunate to have such a wonderful life. As Jimmy Doolittle said, I could never be so lucky again. Fighter pilot Lieutenant Roy June enlisted at age 19. He was attending the University of Montana and decided to become a pilot. He and his college buddies thought flying would be a great adventure. He will never forget June 1st, 1945 in that P-51 aircraft. What started out to be an ordinary day became a May Day. Yes, it was a uh, mission that was uh, set to go to Osaka and it was the largest mission that was, uh, uh, had been developed up to that point. There was 184 P-51s were to leave Iwo Jima and go to Osaka with the B-29s who are on a firebombing mission. Uh, about uh, 375 miles out, we hit um, a solid front. It's like driving from night clear into, uh, day clear into night, and it got so dark I had to turn my uh, cockpit lights on. Uh, the rain was coming through the cockpit and immediately started playing with uh, instruments and I began to hear on the air Mayday, 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 which is the international uh, distress call. Uh, Mayday, I'm bailing out. Mayday, Mayday I've hit another aircraft. Uh, Mayday, Mayday, uh, I'm in trouble. I'm, I'm going to have to bail out. I managed to get through, not to Osaka, but into an area where I could turn around and I tried the top of the overcast. It was at 40 some thousand feet higher than my plane could go. I went down to the water to try and get underneath it. I couldn't do that. So I just turned right around and started to fly right back through it. I was lost. I had no idea where I was. I'd been blown off course. Uh, on the way back through, I heard again, Mayday, Mayday, uh, I'm bailing out. Mayday, I've hit another aircraft. Uh, and these uh, sounds are coming uh, over my radio and in the black of night inside the clouds and I flew on instruments uh, picking up a heading which I thought was back to Iwo Jima but I had no idea mostly because um, uh, I was lost I didn't know where I was uh, I broke out of the uh, clouds and uh, there was a B-29 just as though it had been sent for me I followed the, uh, I signaled the B-29, I couldn't call him on the radio, but I did signal him that um, I was lost and uh, they seemed to get the message and I flew uh, along with them uh, until the, the uh, uh, co-pilot pointed down like this and I looked down and there's the island. So they're the ones that brought me home. Uh, we lost 27 airplanes and 24 pilots on that mission of the 184. Uh, four of the pilots had uh, managed to been bail out and gotten their life raft and were picked up. One pilot was picked up four days later, uh, dehydrated, delirious, and uh, uh, he didn't want to uh, be, be picked up by the submarine. He said, my guys are coming after me. Uh, <clears throat> then
there were hearings uh, after that mission. General Arnold came to Iwo Jima. There were uh, uh, a lot of finger pointing, and they finally came to the conclusion that uh, the weather came up so fast that uh, nobody could have anticipated it. Uh, my squadron lost one-fourth of our people on the flight. We had uh, 20 airplanes out, and we wound up uh, losing five of our people. Uh, as for my own, the rest of my career, uh, I was credited with two uh, half, uh, I shared two half kills, and another one that I think I got, but uh, uh, wasn't given credit for. Um, I did uh, one foolish thing that wound up uh, getting me the DFC. Uh, it sounds <laughs> like whatever turned out, you started as a great adventure, but it turned out to be a very sobering experience. Yes, it was. Yes. It really was. Yeah, I didn't, um, that's probably the, the worst bit of flying I ever had in my life, is that one mission. <clears throat> the rest of the time, uh, uh, fairly routine, uh, as in wartime, as being shot at is routine. Mm. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. We're now standing in front of the B-17, and Stan, you're going to tell us a little bit about this flying fortress. Yeah, this is a B-17G flying fortress. The late model B-17 is, you can tell by the nose turret, only the G had uh, the nose turret on it. This is one of 13 still flyable in the world, and this one's flown very regularly. It just flew a few weeks ago, went over to Chino and back, and the airplanes come alive when you fire them up. You have to see these airplanes fly to really get the feel for it. And this one does. This one was actually built in Southern California by Lockheed Vega. Most B-17s were built by Boeing up in the Seattle area, but this is a Southern California product right here. Uh, the B-17, along with the B-24 Liberator, were our two heavy bombers in World War II. These flew from England all the way to Germany. They bombed Berlin, Frankfurt, all the major targets in Germany fly all the way back. That's an all-day event to go to Germany and back in one of these. These were not very fast, but these were our heavy bombardment for the time. Uh, this is what won the war with heavy bombardment. Um, we have a lot of veterans here at the Air Museum who flew these, uh, and it's a great airplane. And to keep it great, we have a few people here that are dedicated people. We have Joe Lozman right over here, and he is the person who personally takes care of the appearance of this airplane and day in and day out is polishing it. We also have Tony Terraza, who's our facility manager, and he's the one that takes care of all of our airplanes, makes sure everything stays in flyable condition. Now, they're both excellent guys uh, amongst a whole crew that we have here. Um, this particular B-17, as I say, does fly. And how many uh, people actually fit? Uh, there were 10, uh -huh. uh, starting with the, the bombardier up front, the, the pilots, all the gunners. Mm -hmm. And these were young guys. These were guys, you know, 19, 22-year-old. Mm -hmm. And they all had amazing stories, the guys that made it back. But unfortunately, we lost a lot of them. And, you know, it, it's tragic the amount of people we lost due to war in these. But the guys that made it were very, very brave souls, and they still are. Each of these planes has a multitude of personal history associated with it. We're now privileged to be able to hear from some of those personal stories from the pilots who flew them. I would like to introduce Major Marn Wilson, and welcome. You have a story that you'd like to share with us and where you flew? I was a B-17 pilot. Uh, I trained a crew in the States, and we went to England. And we flew 8th Air Force out of uh, England, and most of our, our targets were into Germany. So on March 8, 1944, I had my own crew, which I had trained here in the States, took to England, and joined the bomb group as a replacement crew. The new crew, we got the oldest airplane, and we got the worst position in the formation. This particular day, March 8, 1944, the target was Berlin. Our position in the formation was the Diamond and the High Squadron tail end Charlie, but we happened to be way up on top. Uh, the mission went along pretty good. On the way in, we did in, in, run into some fighter uh, attacks about halfway. Berlin, by the way, was about 900 miles, and our range would cover that. Our fighters went about 750, and then turned around and went back. 
This particular day, as we approached the uh, Berlin area, we were under attack by Focke-Wulf 190s. Now, I was flying a diamond on the top of the group formation, so I was kind of up there by myself. Uh, this Focke-Wulf made an attack. Now, Focke-Wulf 190 was a fighter attack, as you know. He was uh, the best and newest fighter. It also carried cannons in addition to its machine guns. So we didn't like the idea of being fired on by cannons. But this fighter pilot, who was an excellent pilot, he made a pass at us, what we call 11 o'clock high. He comes from this direction. He's got us in a deflection shot. Many of you, especially duck hunters, will know a deflection shot is when the attacking aircraft fires ahead with the idea you're going to fire into their bullets. Our guns couldn't contact him. Uh, the, my uh, closing speed was probably about 600 miles an hour. As he made the approach, I knew that he had us in a perfect deflection shot. He was aiming up here. I was going to fly into his bullets, cannon bullets, which I didn't like. I knew, and I knew he had us. We were dead men. His uh, shells would have ripped our airplane, blown us out of the sky. He made the approach, uh, and I knew the only chance we had to destroy his deflection shot, which was a perfect shot that he had lined up, was for me to pull into him, which I did. Uh, the B-17 does not have booster controls, but I had extra strength. I pulled into him. He popped his stick and slid under us. In the meantime, when I pulled into him, he was firing. We picked up four cannon holes in our right wing. But fortunately, they didn't explode. They went clear through, came out the top of the wing. So we had four jagged holes to show the results of this mission. Uh, at that time, the aircraft, the sharp pull-up, we had stalled out. I recovered, or stalled out, went into a spin. I recovered from the spin, got my power back, rejoined the formation, finished the mission, came on home, came back to our base. There was another group of fighter pilots who will never be forgotten. They were young African-American airmen who had to overcome their country's prejudices to become America's first black combat pilots. Now, a long time in coming, the Tuskegee Airmen Mural will commemorate and honor these great men for their historic and heroic contributions. Stan Stokes is the famous aviation artist who was commissioned to paint the mural. And when completed, this 12-foot high, 60-foot wide mural will be displayed at the Los Angeles International Airport for four months. It will then be permanently displayed at the Palm Springs Air Museum. Two of the Tuskegee Airmen are with us today, and I am very honored to have Dr. Bill Duffy and Dr. Robert Higginbotham. This is uh, an incredible mural, and I know it has great significance to both of you. Could each of you tell me what that significance is to you, Dr. Duffy? Well, it is a fabulous painting. Uh, the significance to me is, to me, it's really a memorial, something that should be known by the, by the world. Um, I hope that uh, people get to see this. I hope they come through the Palm Springs Air Museum uh, because it is well worth seeing. And it is a legacy to the black pilots. And thank you. Uh, the mural to me is similar to Dr. Duffy. I want this mural to be a legacy for the minority groups of this country, that they too realize that they can serve their country in any manner. At the time of World War II, as stated previously, blacks were told that they could not fly. They were, didn't have the intelligence to fly, didn't have the ability to fly. This was disproven by the Tuskegee experiment started in 1942. Initially, the group consisted of, the first class consisted of 15 individuals with five uh, graduating to become second lieutenants and fighter pilots for the 99th Squadron. The mural is a legacy that's left for the children and grandchildren of these flyers. With us is Stan Stokes, who is the world famous aviation artist, and he's been commissioned to paint the Tuskegee mural. Stan, do you have any comments that you would like to make regarding the mural? Well, what I wanted to point out is this is uh, panel number six and panel number seven out of ten, so you can kind of figure where I'm at with the whole thing. This is still bare canvas, so you can see bare canvas up to finished faces. Uh, so this gives a, a good feel for what's going on with the painting. 
I wanted to point out this person in particular. This is Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. He was the commanding officer of the 332nd Fighter Group. He is the person that made the whole Tuskegee Airmen happen. He was part politician, part commanding officer. He flew combat. He also had to go back to Washington, D.C. and lobby Senate and Congress to keep the whole thing going. So this is the person, the most important person in all of the Tuskegee Airmen's story. Uh, very, very important person to know. Everybody should read more about him. Well, Stan and Blaine, it's been a great adventure walking through this history in this incredible Palm Springs Air Museum. And sharing this day with you both has been an absolute joy and definitely something I've enjoyed today. And I want to thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. It's been my pleasure. Thanks so much, Stan. The eyewitness accounts of these docents who volunteer their time to explain the exhibits is an important component of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Over 1,500 veterans are dying daily. This museum serves to preserve their living history for generations to come. There is a quote over the entrance of the museum which states, if we do not honor the valor of our defenders, we diminish their victory. Today we honor and acknowledge these great pilots. <laughs>